live everywhere. Daily Co's Radio on NetworksRadio.com presents David Walton, Kegro in the Morning Show. Now, here's David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is Tuesday, July 9th, 2019. Time for yet another show and time, I guess, to, uh, I don't know. I don't know what to do. Lament the fact, I guess, that we're still stuck on the Epstein story. Lots, uh, lots coming out, lots being realized along the way. Some new, some not so new. But uh, some new takes on things that are not so new, and perhaps we'll spend some time updating that. There's also another weird direction to go. I noticed this morning a strange trend in, uh, piling up since yesterday of stories that allege that the, let's say, the events of the 1980s, the political events of the early to mid-1980s, that so define everything that we still do today, as Greg was discussing yesterday, were understood in a, in, in a completely wrongly, essentially. Everything from a political events to seemingly apolitical events that took on political bent. There's a, that's, a, that's an intriguing uh, direction that we could take the show in, certainly, and uh, maybe we'll do that. <clears throat> Let's take a look at uh, what we have lined up in pocket by way of, well, both of those directions. And uh, a couple of new ones. A lot of discussion on Twitter this morning, though, still is about um, about the the Epstein case and a few other things that uh, raise the hackles and uh, perhaps uh, will uh, inspire you <clears throat> to pull out the old LOL, YOLO, nothing seems to matter line. Um, one unrelated item that similarly got the uh, LOL YOLO and, uh, and, in fact, got the Nothing Matters from Ken Klippenstein, the reporter for the Young Turks, who you may have seen on Twitter discussing this, or discussing anything for that matter. Nothing Matters in this case. The headline from the week is displayed in order to illustrate this point. Chris Kobach, who claimed to have Misspe- oh, who claimed that misspelled names indicated voter fraud. Uh, this is the real point of thing. Uh, of course, uh, he wanted to purge people from the voter rolls because uh, their names were entered incorrectly, either through their own mistake or through the fault of those entering them into the databases. But he claimed all along that misspelled names indicated voter fraud. Turns out to have, through some mysterious process, misspelled his own name in his registration for the Senate race there in Kansas. There is a Chris Kobach with a K registered and a Chris Kobach registered with a C-H, C-H-R-I-S. And uh, while my first assumption was that uh, somebody had been uh, tasked with the uh, duty of filling out the forms and somehow at that stage of the game had no sense of how Chris Kobach spelled his name, Filled it out that way. I don't know how both forms got turned in, though. That seems like voter fraud, too. Anyway, yeah, pretty much uh, well-labeled here. Nothing seems to matter. He can go ahead and get away with it because hmm, white guy. Totally uh, innocent mistake, whereas everybody else is going to have to suffer. No, no news there, I suppose. All right, let's see. Um a few of the other things that inspired the uh, YOLO Nothing Matters label. Did I put this one away? I'll have to sock this one away to share with you later. Uh, but uh, hmm, why are all these tabs suddenly closing? We don't like this version of how things go in the morning. Uh, lots of, uh, oh yes, calls for uh, this morning from Speaker Pelosi for Alex Acosta, currently Secretary of Labor, for Alex Acosta to step down, to resign from his position, uh, based largely on his having put his imprimatur on the sweetheart deal granted to Jeffrey Epstein the first time they put him in confinement way back when, uh, the 13-month sentence in the county jail. We've gone over the details of that, but not lately. We should probably pull those 
old stories out and remind everybody of them. But uh, in the meantime, we'll just say uh, they are in our archives, and you can search those archives and find those Epstein stories and find us complaining about the ridiculousness of the sentence and the lightness with which he was treated. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I've, what are you going to say about that? Uh, okay, so she calls on him to resign. You know I've never loved the call-on formulation that rarely works for anything. It's certainly not as though he was going to have an attack of conscience and actually resign, but it's a nice thing to call for and I guess inches us back toward the question of, uh, is there anything that would make you want to impeach anybody at any level in this administration? Could you, do you think, do you think you could convince the speaker that it would be strategically okay to reintroduce the I word by attempting to impeach Acosta? Probably not, but, uh, I don't know. I guess that's what comes to mind when you, uh, bring the subject up. So we will see. Uh, also, I guess I uh, I noticed that uh, there's been a lot of discussion about, well, a couple of things, two, two topics. One, the more blatant and obvious, I guess, and I think maybe what may have led to the calls for, you know, the, the, the agreement to call for Acosta's resignation. Story yesterday was that uh, during the uh, arrest, uh, of Epstein and during the raid on his New York mansion, uh, law enforcement officials apparently found a large cache of <clears throat> nude photos of underage girls, which probably wouldn't surprise you if you knew why Jeffrey Epstein was in trouble and why he was being arrested, rearrested, I guess. Um, but would surprise you because you might think, Oh, he's a rational human being who understands the nature of his crimes. But, you know, obviously he's suffering from some sort of bizarre mental illness here, uh, compounding the difficulties he's he's got personally, which he's taking out on others in criminal fashion. And I guess he just he, so it's evidence either that he thought he was acting entirely with impunity, that he was going to be protected by someone, whether that was Donald Trump because they're friends or Donald Trump because Donald Trump knows that he's got compromising information about Donald Trump or other prosecutors elsewhere. I mean, the big going theory about Epstein is that he thought he was protected because, uh, well, the, the, like I said, the theory is that he had uh, compromising information about enough prominently placed politicians and law enforcement officials and rich people, etc., that they would rally to his defense and prevent him from being imprisoned on any of these charges. Whether or not any of that is true, well, I guess we'll wait and see now that he's back into the legal system. But it certainly appears to be evidence of some amazing sort of hubris that he would, one, <clears throat> having uh, having been arrested and convicted of his of of, of a watered down, severely watered down version of his crimes those years ago, and. I mean, he has to have seen that his name was entering back into circulation of late uh, for him to keep photos like that around, especially, well, the digital files of the photos on on discs that he actually labeled, you know, nude girl pictures or whatever. Uh, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, he clearly just thought they were never, ever, ever coming for him at all. So I don't know what to tell you. I grabbed this and people were circulating yesterday the tweets from Erica Orden, a CNN reporter covering, uh, well, special counsel probe and law enforcement in New York, according to her Twitter bio. And she shared that yesterday. Here's what law enforcement officials found in Jeffrey Epstein's Upper East Side mansion on Saturday night when they executed a search warrant, according to the Southern District of New York's detention memo. We have this uh, screen grab here, I guess from 
I don't know what, uh, a document put out by the Southern District of New York. Finally, despite having been previously convicted of a sex offense involving an underage victim, the defendant has continued to maintain a vast trove of lewd photographs of young-looking women or girls in his mansion, Manhattan mansion. In a search of the New York residents on the night of his arrest on July 6th and 7th, 2019, pursuant to judicially authorized warrants, Law enforcement officers discovered not only specific evidence consistent with victim recollections of the inside of the mansion, further strengthening the evidence of the conduct charged in the indictment. They never really had a look inside to see whether that would be corroborated before. Amazing. But also at least hundreds and perhaps thousands of sexually suggestive photographs of fully or partially nude females. While these items were only seized this weekend and are still being reviewed, Some of the nude or partially nude photographs appear to be of underage girls, including at least one girl who, according to her counsel, they actually have that girl identified and she's represented by counsel already. This girl was underage at the time that the relevant photos were taken. Additionally, some of the photographs referenced herein were discovered in a locked safe in which law enforcement officers also found compact discs with handwritten labels, including the following young the word young, and then the name of the person and the name of another person. Young, one person, and two persons. One labeled Miscellaneous Nudes 1 and Girl Picks Nude. Now, I don't know what to tell you. I I, I don't know why he felt the need to label them at all, but uh, and not to be creative about it at all. You'd think he might enjoy coming up with creative names for things like this, but I guess not. He's a busy man. Doing what? I have no idea. The defendant, a registered sex offender, is not reformed. He is not chastened. He is not repentant. Rather, he is continuing a continuing danger to the community and an individual who faces devastating evidence supporting deeply serious charges. By the way, that is footnoted, the not reformed, not chastened, and not repentant. Footnoted here, I don't have the, uh, I don't have the note itself but I'm guessing that that may come from perhaps court filings that he once, that Epstein once uh, filed, or that his lawyers filed on his behalf, insisting that he ought to be treated with leniency, perhaps in his first sentencing, because uh, I'm guessing that, you know, he, he claimed at the time to have been reformed, chastened, and repentant. And I Yes, they think that's not the case there in the Southern District of New York. And, uh, well, they'd be right. All right. Let's see. Do I have that one marked? Uh, I've got that one uh, in my tweet stream, but we'll put it in pocket to make it easier to find later on and uh, keep on combing down through what we've been reading about Epstein and others in the past couple of hours and retweeting about that. Here's an interesting, there's another interesting direction that, uh, that, that, that things are going here. Uh, what am I looking at here? I've got tweets from Virginia Heffernan, who we've discussed, uh, well, we've discussed her tweets on the air before, a contributing editor to Wired and a columnist at the LA Times opinion section. It is herein revealed and uh she's been well she's been following well a lot of things but i know uh of late she's been talking about jeffrey epstein an awful lot and i probably should just open up our tweet stream and read that but the things i put aside or thought that were really interesting were uh notes that are emerging not all of which um well none of which i can actually confirm for you myself it's not research i've done myself and occasionally you find out that these very definitive sounding statements of fact uh, fall apart at some level, but uh, typically more so with people who are amateur sleuths than people who are regular columnists who uh, at least are trained to some extent in journalistic practice and fact checking. So let's take a look. Um, Let's see, at first, first one we have here, is um, relevant, I think, to the the big question 
now circulating this morning, which is how the hell did Jeffrey Epstein get where he is? I mean, it's interesting because now here in 2019, the idea of a billionaire, an abusive billionaire child molester, for that matter, you know, really, I guess we're sort of used to the idea of abusive uh, billionaire playboys, I guess we could say. And that was probably the label that you might have hung on Donald Trump back in the day. However, um, well, <clears throat> actually, one of the major themes of the piece mentioned yesterday and that we discussed on the air many times, the uh, we all knew about the trafficking piece over the diary at uh, Daily Coast now some years ago. Uh, one of the major themes actually of the piece, besides the fact that Donald Trump was involved in all of this sort of stuff, uh, was that I, I, it's interesting, I hesitate to say it, but as a product of the times, which is often uh, an excuse that gets wielded to dismiss or, or diminish the egregious nature of the crimes being put under the microscope. But um, one of the major themes was that from the late 70s through into the mid 80s and maybe a little earlier, even in the, the late 70s, um, there was a, I guess, as part of the early version of what we now recognize as, I guess, rape culture, um, there was a more prevalent uh, openness to open discussion and exploitation even of uh, of female sexuality well below the age of consent. There was this just this strange, I mean, I guess it's always been there and it's still there now, but there was this weird openness to the idea, this brief window, um, thankfully, mostly closed down, unfortunately, never eliminated and never really even erased from prevalence honestly i mean i think that's happening like i said it's just always been there and and continues but there was this weird sense in the 70s where there was a popular culture numbness nobody spoke up and said what the hell are we doing for instance to brooke shields that's probably the most prominent example of it um there, there and and there was a, i mean she rose to fame on the back of, <clears throat> of of mainstream general release feature films that were about the that were that were about the subject of sexualized underage girls, and nobody said, "Hey, that's." I mean, it's a, I guess it's a legitimate top of sorts for artistic exploration in the most open-minded uh, general approach you could possibly take to something like this and say, well, uh, all right, if you're about, if you're, if you're as a wide open, a liberal, lowercase liberal, um, you know, uh, 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 I don't know what to say. I'm, I'm a little flabbergasted, but we're even on the subject, but the most open-minded possible approach to freedom of expression say all right well it's a topic that happens and it can be explored in sensitive fashion i don't know if that's how you're doing it um we might simply say well it's really delicate and you might want to stay away from that and you're opening yourself up for an awful lot of criticism like today we wouldn't green light that film let's say but back then I don't know. There were, I mean, it was it was the late stages, the latest stages of the sexual revolution and immediately preceding the, I guess, what we now think of as the Reagan era backlash against that. And uh, people thought that films like that, well, it's a legit topic. Now, you could, of course, explore that with an actress who is of age, of consent, but just doesn't look like it. And you could approach it that way uh, if you dare. Or, but hey, back in the day, they just thought, I guess, for whatever reason, that that was something that they could explore uh, 
with a uh, method acting approach, perhaps, if you wanted to come up with some sort of strange euphemism for this thing. It's very weird, to be sure. And if you don't remember that aspect of it, I recommend reviewing the article. And maybe we'll uh, open it up and put it back in circulation and put it back in the uh, roundup again today as we did yesterday. And you can see for yourself. Okay. Virginia Heffernan's point, though. Uh, she was focusing more specifically on the strange appearance of Jeffrey Epstein on the world stage. Today, we uh, sort of don't bat an eye at uh, eyelash at the idea of a billionaire playboy or even a billionaire child molester who spends their money indulging this predilection and covering it up in whatever fashion. I mean, it's a plausible idea. It, we've seen it happen before. And also, we're used to the idea of billionaires running around and being unworthy people. Uh, I think many years ago, of course, well, one of the real weirdnesses about the Jeffrey Epstein story is that someone else pointed out there, there weren't this many... There weren't that many billionaires back when he got started. It wasn't something that you threw around like a joke in the way we do today. And today there are, there, I don't know, somehow there's there's hundreds, thousands of people claiming anyway to be billionaires running around out there. And we've gotten used to the idea. But back then it wasn't the case. And then when you begin to look at it like, well, was Jeffrey Epstein just one of those financial geniuses that made it possible to become a billionaire? That happens Usually these days, uh, typically, the, the, well, what, what they describe as financial genius, we describe from the outside as, uh, well, they just have a, uh, a real talent for finding borderline ways of stealing from people. And that's all there is to it. But, I mean, Jeffrey Epstein didn't make anything, didn't do anything. However, again, we're kind of used to that, too. Billionaire hedge fund managers are a thing. These days, although honestly, if you're straight up a hedge fund manager, then not a lot of them have become billionaires straight up. They're awfully rich and they're making hundreds of millions of dollars a year, but they're not at the billionaire level yet. <clears throat> but it was even more rare then. And I don't think I put this one aside, but I do think I saw it this morning. Somebody was, I don't know if I retweeted it or what, and we'll see if we can find it, but saying that, you know, there just weren't, I mean, there's literally a handful of billionaires and no more than that back when Epstein got his start in the early 80s. And I, I don't know if I can find that one again, or maybe I can grab it during the break. Heffernan, though, was saying, in addition to all this, Jeffrey Epstein and this is not impossible, there are other billionaires who did this, didn't go to college. And that's not, you know, I mean, well, sometimes people would say that's strike one against you in your quest for billions, probably. But Bill Gates, whatever, right? But Epstein's no Bill Gates. So she says Epstein, who didn't go to college, is a billionaire. Um, but he started off his working life not he didn't go directly into finance because he was such a genius at it. He started off working at the Dalton School, which is a very expensive private school, very expensive and relatively exclusive private school in New York City. And he started off as a as a teacher there. Now, that's unusual on a number of levels, but uh, one of which is, well, he didn't go to college. And usually when you're talking about very expensive, very exclusive private schools in New York City. They would um, pride themselves on this point and they would offer themselves up as worth the money to New York City parents by saying, well, our, our faculty is extraordinarily distinguished. But what if your faculty isn't? Well, what kind of, you know, what kind of person would you would you want then teaching your kids if they weren't distinguished by having college degrees or higher degrees than that. Uh, I don't know. And maybe they didn't know at the time that he had this predilection. But again, we are looking squarely, uh, factually, in a, looking squarely in the face of a situation where 
a serial pedophile has been hired as a high school teacher at a very expensive and ritzy private school. The sort of school, in fact, probably where, one, they would think that their money was protecting them from such things, and two, at the very least, they would think that their money, and I guess to this extent, to this date, it has prevented the scandal from leaking out. You wouldn't want it. You would, you'd think that these would be the kind of parents who would say, we can't let this sort of thing get out, and we're very rich people, and so it won't get out. We can't have people thinking that this goes on at the Dalton School. Well, I guess it stayed hidden for the most part up until now. But okay, Jeffrey Epstein, who didn't go to college, is a billionaire who started off work at the very high dollar Dalton School, Virginia says, teaching teenagers when he was inexplicably hired without a college degree to do this, all by, as it turns out, the headmaster of the school, who is United States Attorney General Bill Barr's father. Did you know that? That comes as a surprise to me. I had no idea. I mean, I don't know why we would have any idea. And, you know, I mean, these are sometimes just these weird coincidences that just happen. Uh, sometimes there's it's got something to do with something and sometimes it doesn't. I mean, lots of uh, there are other people that have strange connections to the Dalton School. Like, for instance, if you wanted to look for well, I'm going to say it, I guess. One, if you want to look for a person who has a connection to the Dalton School, but probably does not have any connection whatsoever to any of this and would be very upset and embarrassed to uh, have to even answer questions about it. Um, uh, good Netroots Nation friend, comedian, fellow blogger and podcaster Katie Halper is a teacher at the Dalton School, right? So, I mean, nobody suspects even remotely that she has anything to do with that. It's just one of those things that can come up. Could that be with the Barr family? Sure, I guess so. But hi, everybody. It's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Or read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Then send the file to me at kgrox at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything, but if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. Welcome back now to the Kegro in the Morning Show here on Networks Radio. Man, I, okay, you know, so some weird things we're learning about the origins of Jeffrey Epstein. And I think I did find the tweet I was thinking of earlier, but perhaps I will continue on with Virginia Heffernan's thread here. I had retweeted that one and uh, also the uh, other very interesting revelation from the arrest over the weekend. Virginia had uh, tweeted. And by the way, you can find Virginia Heffernan on Twitter as page 88. Page 88 is the Twitter handle. She uh, also sent around yesterday this, uh, I guess, revelation from the arrest. Crowbars used on Epstein's house at 9 East 71, as I guess 71st Street, designed as a 40-room French Renaissance palace for Herbert Strauss of Macy's, originally. The house is among the largest private residences in Manhattan. Apparently, he used to delight in telling people that it was, in fact, the largest private residence in Manhattan. Estimated variously at, uh, well, two very different numbers, 21,000 and 50,000 square feet. One more than double the other. I'm not really sure how that would happen, but okay. And uh, the real impact of the, of the tweet, though, comes at the end. Epstein evidently held children as sex hostages there. So another entry in the Pizzagate was projection files. You can put that one aside and, uh, well, do what you will. Uh, let's see. So the rest of I might as well look through the rest of her thread here. Uh, connected to this one about the, the allegation that he actually held children captive there. Wow. 
was this next one here. Epstein bought the house from his mentor, client, and man credited with making him, Leslie Wexner of The Limited, The Limited Stores, and also, uh, I believe, uh, they are the owners of Victoria's Secret. So this is where that guy's fortune came from. Wexner re never really lived there, and it's estimated that Wexner ended up paying about a million dollars for each night that he actually spent at the house, which is to say that he was an absentee uh, owner of the place, which just, I guess, tells you about how much money the guy had lying around. Visitors, it's according to the New York Times in 1996, Virginia says, this quoted piece here, it's not uh, screen grabbed, it's just retyped. Visitors described a bathroom reminiscent of James Bond movies, hidden beneath a stairway, lined with lead to provide shelter from attack, and supplied with closed-circuit television screens and a telephone, both concealed in a cabinet beneath the sink. So an early report of an early panic room being discussed here. That's... That's interesting, too. Fun fact, she says in her next tweet in the thread, the house's architect also designed Klaus von Bülow's palace in Newport, Rhode Island. Reminder, by the way, von Bülow, who almost certainly killed his wife, was, as it says here, gotten off by his lawyer, Alan Dershowitz. Another strange connection. The Trump ally and Epstein lawyer who has admitted to using massage services in Epstein's Florida house, but only massage services, of course, I'm sure. Much more fun facts from the New York Times in her next tweet here. The house also has a heated sidewalk, a luxurious provision that explains why, while snow blankets the eastern seaboard, the Wexner house this is strange enough, but also Bill Cosby's house across the street. They must have gotten the idea from one another. Both remain opulently snow-free, much to the delight of neighborhood dogs. <clears throat> Not really sure why the dog mentioned there, but I guess it's a, something special in the neighborhood. And uh, I'm sure they had opportunities to have casual conversation with one another about why their sidewalks remain snow-free and how they could get it at their place, too. I don't know who went first, but... I, Possibly they shared the idea. Cosby, Von Bulow, Alan Dershowitz. Also close in the Epstein fold, Donald Trump, Bill Clinton, Prince Andrew, and Kevin Spacey. Two presidents, two entertainers, two socialite lawyers, one royal, visiting Epstein's obscenely expensive houses with their secret passages and child sex slaves. Sounds lascivious, doesn't it? All right. Uh, Jeffrey Epstein, who didn't go to college. There's the entry we read before. Is a billionaire. Started off work at the Dalton School. Hired for no particular reason by headmaster. Uh, I don't know the uh, the act his father's first name, but uh, the headmaster at the time, the father of now Attorney General Bill Barr, who sees nothing wrong in all of this case and is perfectly fine with everything. Epstein first started making money at Bear Stearns, the now defunct investment bank. He then invested for Wexner. So uh, I guess this is where he got his start in all this. Did I mark this for later? Yes, it did. Okay. Uh, so Bear Stearns, I guess, is where he picks up the Wexner business originally. And then he just leaves and takes it with him, which was an odd thing at the time. Started making money at Bear Stearns, the now defunct investment bank, and then invested for Wexner. It's exceedingly rare, Virginia says, for people to make a billion dollars investing the money of others. And uh, that struck me as odd. I didn't know that that was the case. I, I feel like we hear all the time about emerging an emerging class of billionaire hedge fund managers, but it may be that they were already very wealthy and then they began managing their own money, their own hedge bets essentially and then just opened it up as a fund to others and pushed themselves over the top of the bill but she says it's exceedingly rare for people to make a billion investing the money of others bernie madoff and his wife were worth 126 million dollars at the height of their powers although that was some time ago and things have increased exponentially since then and it is interesting i, I keep thinking every once in a while back to how um we viewed uh, Mitt Romney, 
as incredibly, even perhaps obscenely wealthy. And I think he was pinning his wealth at about $250 million at the time. And thinking about, you know, that versus at least the claims that Donald Trump makes. Now, we think that a lot of Donald Trump's claims are lies, but uh, yeah, people with $126 million, $250 million are looked at as like chump change almost these days because we're so used to such obscene wealth out there. I mean, Bezos, I think, is a hundred and something billion, right? I mean, I think he's he's a hundred plus billion dollars, although he just gave away half of it to his now ex-wife. So, you know, times are tough. But I think she got like a 90 something billion dollar payout. So imagine how much is still in his hands. So anyway, continuing with Virginia Heffernan's thread here. So a dropout who grew up in Coney Island gets a break from Barr's father, becomes a billionaire somehow, buys massive houses and private planes, and though he has a pattern of kidnapping kids for sex slavery and his charity is deeply sketchy, we're to believe he made a billion dollars, quote, investing. And that does raise a few questions, doesn't it? I mean... He's not starting with a base of millions of dollars or hundreds of millions of dollars, as some of the new generation of billionaires did. He's starting with next to nothing and just amassing a billion dollars by the early 80s and spending massively at the same time. So he's got apparently no worries about the money continuing to come in. He's brand new wealthy. And he's buying houses and private islands and private planes all over the place. The biggest private residence in Manhattan and still has a billion lying around for some unknown reason. I think you can see where the speculation is beginning to go. Epstein wanted to base his modeling agency on Trump's. This was discussed yesterday, and I guess uh, Greg had seen the, the same comment here. He wanted to base his modeling agency on Trump's, which had long been suspected of being a front for trafficking, a trafficking organization. Seems at least possible the 100 witnesses who testified to Epstein's sex crimes could have exposed a powerful network complicit in crimes against humanity. Thanks to, well, thanks always, Virginia says, to uh, Julie Brown, the uh, Miami Herald investigative reporter, who basically has driven this story back into the news. So thanks given to her and to the Miami Herald for her continued reporting. And without Brown, the crimes would have continued. Uh, Almost certainly true. Uh, Let's see, there's one last tweet in the thread here. A a PS from Julie Brown here. Four accomplices in Epstein's agreement, including Nadia uh, Marcinkova, or Marcinkova, I'm not certain how you would pronounce that, got immunity. Marcinkova was a young girl when Epstein brought her from Yugoslavia to live with him. Hmm. Brought from Yugoslavia as a young girl suggests global infrastructure, she says, from the start. And, of course, also reminds us of, uh, well, not Yugoslavia, but Czechoslovakia, I suppose, reminds us a little bit of Ivana Trump in that sense, or Melania, for that matter, two imported models from Eastern European countries that something, something, something. Gosh, I don't know how to draw any more parallels than that. All right. So I also saw this morning, this time from Jesse uh, Isinger, senior reporter and editor from ProPublica, uh, as a matter of fact, um, commenting this morning, I had not realized until today how nothing about Jeffrey Epstein's business or career makes any sense. This is just a very short thread, or at least it was earlier this morning. Um, Maybe only two tweets, but uh, collecting from uh, a, a, a source here. So he says, I had not realized how until today about how nothing about his business or career makes any sense. And this is where the, the fact blurb came from. For instance, it says there were only 13 billionaires in the United States in 1982, which is when Epstein set out on his own. And so why is that of interest? Um, Let's see, what is the link to here? It says hypertextbook.com slash facts, which makes it sound like it's totally factual and everything, but I'm not sure what this is 
linking to the physics fact book. Okay, I guess this is the num for a, a source for the number of billionaires. I guess. Hmm. Um, yeah. So here, uh, I guess the source that they're using for that number is a book called Feudalism, or maybe it's a is a, is an article. What Feudalism? Alias American Capitalism. Can I, is that a link? Can I go to that? What is that exactly? I mean, it's probably worth clicking through to figure out, okay, it's a source. Is it a good source? And I can't tell because it doesn't open anything. So for your own edification, uh, it doesn't link anywhere in particular. Now, it's an August 1995 date attached to this thing. Is a Bibliographic entry for each of these results. What is this? So this is uh, the physics fact book, as I mentioned to you, is what you find at hypertextbook.com slash facts slash 2005 slash Michelle Lee dot shtml. I mean, literally, I couldn't tell you what this is. So maybe it's totally bogus. I don't know. Um but the topic of this page here is the number of billionaires, an educational fair use website, it calls itself. Uh, but the, the page topic of this page, number of billionaires. And let's see uh, what it what it has here for it has various, I guess, entries for estimates of the number of billionaires, according to different sources. But I only see. Three things here from 2000, and I guess this is, what do we say? This is a 2005 page, according to the, you know, if the URL means anything. Uh, a 2004 entry noting 587 people, according to Forbes magazine, which is a lot easier to understand as a source. Uh, Louisa Kroll's Rising Tide article in Forbes, volume 173, Dated 15 March 2004, page 91. Easy, right? This year, Forbes reports a record 587 billionaires in 2004. Then the next entry here is, it just says, David, period. Like, I guess the, the author's last name is David. Feudalism, ellipsis, alias American capitalism, August 1995. A book, perhaps, by an author by the last name of David. Not very helpful quite honestly. But it then reads, statistics published in Forbes magazine's annual survey of America's billionaires exposed this little known but shocking reality. In 1982, there were 13 billionaires. In 1983, 15. 1984, 12. In 1985, 13. 86, 26. 87, 1987, 49. It then goes on to say, note carefully that prior to 1986, the number of American billionaires had averaged around 13. Then the Reagan administration drastically altered the wealth distribution patterns. I think we can believe that pretty easily enough by introducing new tax legislation favoring the top 1%. In 1986, the number of billionaires doubled. And by 1987, the number of billionaires had virtually quadrupled to 49. By 1988, there were 68 individuals or families that each had net worth in excess of a billion dollars. By 1989, the number had risen precipitously to 82, and by 1990, when I finally graduated from college, it was all too late. The Forbes survey reported the staggering total of 99. See the graph below, he says, although I don't think, oh yeah, the graph is here. Graph below, which summarizes the results from 1982 to 1990, although, okay. One, you can't see the graph, it's radio. Two, I just read you every single number. So there you have it. Uh, so from 13 people in 1982 to 99 people in 1990, then finally one last entry just for fun, Forbes, world's richest people, Forbes, 10 May, 2005. And then it says, see the chart below, which summarizes the result from Forbes from 1996 to 2005. So there's another chart, um, pegging the number in 1996 at 423 billionaires. And in 2005, 691 billionaires. This is not really the point that uh, Jesse Isinger was making about the growth, but that might lead us into the second half of the program, uh, re-examining that 
period of time and what was going on in our heads and what we have come away with as the mythology of the 80s uh, versus what might have been the reality. Okay, so there you have it. Um, that's the source, according to Michelle Lee, of Jesse Isinger's claim that there were only 13 billionaires in the United States in 1982. Why does that matter? Wow. Well, Jesse has this screen grab. And is this also from the same page? Because there's a tremendous amount of text underneath. No, it's not that tremendous. On Michelle Lee's page. But it doesn't come from here. But this, there's a screen grab in Jesse Isinger's tweet, which I don't know if it tells you where it comes from, although the second tweet identifies New York Magazine article as the source of its second screen grab. They may both have come from that. We'll check that one out next. So here's the screen grab text. In 1982, when there were only 13 billionaires, according to Michelle Lee, or her sources, anyway. In 1982, according to those who knew Epstein, he set up his own shop, J. Epstein and Company, which remains his core business today. So that's the business he's in. Where did he get his billions of dollars? From J. Epstein and Company. How did he become a billionaire? J. Epstein and Company. What did he do before J. Epstein and Company? Bear Stearns. What did he do before Bear Stearns? He was a teacher at the Dalton School. What did he do before that? Nothing. He was dropping out of college. So that's a that's a hell of a trajectory. College, dropout, teaching at a ritzy school, to be sure, I'm sure they paid him well, to Bear Stearns, to I'm a billionaire. So, in 1982, according to those who know Epstein, he sets up his own shop, which remains the core business today. His pre The premise behind it was simple. Ready for this one? Like, today, you can buy it. You know, you can understand why this is the, the premise. In 1982, in the context of 13 billionaires in the, in the world, I guess, this is a weird premise. The premise behind it was simple. Epstein would manage the individual and family fortunes of clients with $1 billion or more, which is where the mystery deepens, because according to the lore, Epstein, in 1982, immediately began collecting clients. There were no road shows, no whiz-bang marketing demos, just this. Jeff Epstein was open for business for those with a billion dollars plus. In 1982, that's all of 13 people. Can you tell me what it is about the guy who's a college dropout, who teaches at the Dalton School, who works a couple of years at Bear Stearns and then just says, me, the famous Jeffrey Epstein, I'm hanging out my own shingle, if you've got a billion dollars, and don't you dare come to me unless you have a billion or more, I'm willing to take your money. And they said, yeah. And I guess it would have to be like all 13 of them, right? Jesse's second tweet in this thread. Here's a passage suggesting Epstein's billionaire clients would give him their billion, and that's in quotes, and sign over power of attorney. Yes, those meek little billionaires. This according to... New York Magazine, and I'll open up that article. Let's take a look at what that one is. That's a 2002 piece. So predating his arrest, his initial arrest, by several years. So no interest in hiding anything at this point. But New York Magazine, an October 28, 2002 piece entitled Jeffrey Epstein, International Money Man of Mystery by Landon Thomas Sr. That might be worth reading all by itself. But the excerpt that Jesse grabs reads this way. From the get-go, his business was successful, but the conditions for investing with Epstein were steep. He would take total control of the billion dollars. Now, again, just for uh, to pause here, you're talking about a universe of 13 billionaires in 1982. And his condition, this unknown douchebag from no place, his conditions for buying into his fund, which based on nothing, is if you've got a billion dollars, I want all of it. Okay, so the conditions were investing, for instance, were steep. He would take total control of the billion dollars, charge a flat fee, and assume power of attorney to do whatever he thought was necessary to advance his client's financial cause. And he remained true to the $1 billion entry fee. 
According to people who know him, if you were worth $700 million and felt the need for the services of Epstein and company, you would receive a not so polite no thank you from Epstein. That's the claim. I guess we could say it's obviously got to be a lie unless it's not. In which case, you know, we play the dramatic music and freak out. But in a universe of 13 billionaires, the conditions were you got to give me all of that billion and power of attorney. How many of the world's existing 13 billionaires would have accepted those conditions? How could that possibly be? It can't, at least not in exchange for money management. I mean, I think money management 101 is don't give away the entirety of your fortune plus power of attorney ever. You're going to want to keep some. I mean, you might be willing to risk all your capital in investments, but really with one person who's not particularly distinguished in any way. And at that point, not even even close to rich and doesn't have any particular track record from Bear Stearns even to run on. I don't know. Apparently, he was a very charming fellow, <laughs> let's say. Now, um, interestingly, there is a comment in response to this from someone who's reading this thing who says Jeffrey Epstein's life is Bill Browder-esque in some ways. Bill Browder, of course, is the, you know, whatever, bazillionaire investor guy, international man of mystery, who apparently made all of his money in post-Soviet Russia and who ended up He's he's the guy on the allegedly American side of the Magnitsky Act. It was his, uh, what was it, attorney Magnitsky? Attorney slash money manager slash business partner of some kind who was either the namesake of the Magnitsky Act who was killed by, I guess, Putin's government. Uh, and they, of course, claim that he's a great international criminal and fraud, which is, of course, what we're saying is the case with Epstein. So an interesting comparison. It may be a loaded one. Jeffrey Epstein's life is Bill Browder-esque in some ways, making an insane amount of money in finance coming out of nowhere, lots of political connections, untouchable despite a lot of evidence of serious crimes. Makes one wonder if slash how Epstein is connected to, e.g., the CIA and FBI. I guess it makes people wonder what his connections are. I don't know whether CIA, FBI is where I would have gone with that one, but... Who knows? Maybe. Well, that's the end of Jesse Isinger's relatively short thread on this subject. But, uh, you know, it brings up a lot of questions and it brings up my I'm, I'm sort of curious now to see maybe we skim or read through this Jeffrey Epstein article from 2002 and see if there's anything else in here worth worthy of note. And maybe. Uh, after the top of the hour break, we'll consider switching over to examining 1980s lore as uh, originally promised here. Let's see. Oh, by the way, just, just sort of catch up on, maybe we'll catch up on comments after the break and see if we go in a slightly different direction. I can see a couple of good suggestions already. So Jeffrey Epstein, International Money Man of Mystery by Landon Thomas Jr., he comes with cash to burn, a fleet of airplanes, and a keen eye for the ladies, the ladies, the children, really, to say nothing of a rel relentless brain that challenges Nobel Prize winning scientists across the country and for financial markets around the world. I guess I'll pause here just for a second to say, by the way, there are savants of various kinds who, yes, will... Uh, have a brilliant mind. And I, allegedly, the, I guess the story was that it was a mathematical mind that inspired Mr. Barr, whoever it was, to uh, hire him, I, presumably to teach that math to kids at the Dalton School. And, uh, you know, there are, I guess, other examples out there of people of that caliber who just find the college life pointless in general. And I suppose if you think you've stumbled upon a way to make more money than you would uh, otherwise make in any traditional occupation you, and think you can do it reliably, why bother? You know, shall I get a mathematics degree? Why? To what end? When I can mathematically just cheat everybody out of all their money and get away with it 
Or, you know, sell sex slaves to people and use that as a method of raising money and staying out of trouble. Uh, well, it didn't work very well for staying out of trouble. But anyway, I mean, there are such people. And other examples do come to mind. And occasionally it happens. Okay. So, uh, by the way, Robert Mercer would be another such example, although I don't know that he's a college dropout. He, again, one of those prickly sorts who happens to have an amazing mathematical mind can't get along necessarily socially on a normal level with anybody else, but has managed to turn his math savant status into billions of dollars. I guess he would make another interesting case study. Does his money make any sense? Anyway, ever since the Post's page six ran an item about the president's late September visit, this would be uh, at this point, um, I suppose, President Clinton. Uh, but, uh, well, uh, in 2002, he was no longer the president, of course, but I'm just interested in this. Ever since the Post's page six ran an item about the president's late September visit to Africa with Kevin Spacey and Chris Tucker on his new benefactor's customized Boeing 727. That'd be Epstein 727. The question of the day has been, who in the world is Jeffrey Epstein? And I guess this was their first attempt to answer that. It's a life full of question marks, they say. Epstein is said to run a $15 billion fund for wealthy clients. Yet, aside from limited founder Leslie Wexner, his client list is a closely held secret. Where did he collect the other, at least, well, I don't know, how they all invested $1 billion, but remember, that was the entry fee, and this is only 2002. Only billionaires numbering barely in the hundreds at that point. Hmm, very strange. We'll be right back. Welcome back now to the Kegel in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Got to put another item aside for later discussion, maybe, possibly. Anyway, yes, so as we left off here, 2002, I guess, uh, do we have a chart on that one? Yeah, 2002 had uh, charted 497 billionaires from which to draw his approximately 10 to 15 clients, most of whose names are secret for some reason. But uh, whatever is all I can tell you here. So Leslie Wexner is the only one who's publicly known here. A former Dalton math teacher, it says here, uh, and I guess in New York Magazine, you don't have to say what the hell's a Dalton math teacher. They know. A former Dalton math teacher, he maintains a parapetetic, Pathetic, I have to get that word right. Salon of brilliant scientists, yet possesses no bachelor's degree. It is possible. For more than 10 years, he's been linked to Manhattan, London society figure Ghislaine Maxwell. We all know what she ended up being uh, accused of. Daughter of the mysteriously deceased media titan Robert Maxwell. Yet he lives the life of a bachelor, logging 600 hours a year in his various planes as he scours the world for investment opportunities. Sure. He owns what is said to be Manhattan's largest private house, yet runs his business from a 100-acre private island in St. Thomas. Because why not? Because remember, a couple of years ago, he was a teacher, at a, albeit at a ritzy school. And before that, he was nothing and uh, apparently came from Coney Island. And now that he's come into a certain amount of money, he's buying islands and the largest private house in Manhattan, but never staying there. Power on Wall Street, the article continues, has generally accrued to those who have made their open bids for it. Soros, this is 2002, Soros. Wasserstein, Kravis, Wheel, Weil, I don't know who that is, W-E-I-L-L, -L. I, I never know these things. The Sturm und Drang of their successes and failures has been played out in public. Epstein breaks the mold. Smashy, there it goes. That's the mold breaking. Most everyone on the street has heard of him, but nobody seems to know what the hell he is up to, which is just the way he likes it. My belief is that Jeff maintains some sort of money management firm. There's other people who don't even know what he does. That he, my belief is that he maintains some sort of money management firm, though you won't get a straight answer from him, says one well-known investor. 
I guess, but not in his fund. Uh, he once told me he had 300 people working for him. And I've also heard that he manages Rockefeller money. But one never knows. It's like looking at the Wizard of Oz. There may be less there than meets the eye. And remember, this was the age of Donald Trump, who absolutely came up the same way. By the way, speaking of catching up on comments, uh, Mad Hatter commenting about the current piece here. Amazing how the Epstein story is a house of cards upon close examination. A whole den of corruption uh, hiding behind his doors. No wonder he hangs with Trump. Yeah, he's very much uh, the same sort of person, I guess. Hmm. Uh, by the way, Michael Musson commenting earlier on the Acosta resignation, confused as to why the speaker would call for Acosta's resignation. Isn't the coming election the best way to replace him as well as his boss? Well, you would think so, but somehow she judges it less politically risky to talk about the um, uh, removal of a cabinet official. And, you know, we can see why, I think. All right. Uh, continuing on, says another prominent Wall Streeter, he is this mysterious Gatsby-esque figure. Good call there, I think. He likes people to think he is very rich, and he cultivates this air of aloofness. The whole thing is weird. The wizard that meets the eye is spare and fit with a long jaw, and it's kind of disgusting to hear him described physically, but here it is. Uh, and carefully quaffed head of silver hair, he looks like a taller, younger Ralph Lauren. A raspy Brooklyn accent betrays his Coney Island origins. He spends an hour and 15 minutes every day doing advanced yoga with his personal instructor who travels with him wherever he goes. He is an enthusiastic member of the Trilateral Commission. Wait a second, that definitely deserves some dramatic music. Not only the Trilateral Commission, but the Council on Foreign Relations. Seriously, am I dating myself in that? I mean, does everybody recognize those as traditional conspiracy theorist uh, centers of power? Anyway, he dresses casually, jeans, open-necked shirts, and sneakers, and is rarely seen in a tie. Indeed, those close to him say the reason he quit his board seat at the Rockefeller Institute, for God's sake, was that he hated wearing a suit. It feels like a dress, he told one friend. Epstein likes to tell people that he's a loner, a man who's never touched alcohol or drugs and whose nightlife is far from energetic. And yet if you talk to Donald Trump, I mean, OK, I mean, should I come up with a different what, what else could I uh, uh, come up with for a a Donald Trump sound effect? I don't have that many. If you talk to Donald Trump. Well, what the hell is supposed to do, you moron? I don't know. Or possibly... Uh, Liar! There Liar! we go. That's probably a better Liar! one. Anyway, if you talk to Donald Trump... Boring! You know, uh, Epstein, a different Epstein emerges. I've known Jeff for 15 years. You've all seen this circulating the last two days very heavily on Twitter. I've known, I've known Jeff for 15 years. Terrific guy. Trump booms from a speakerphone, of course. He's a lot of fun to be with. It is even said that he likes beautiful women as much as I do, and many of them are on the younger side. No doubt about it, Jeffrey enjoys his social life. Hmm. Yeah, it is uh, sort of different. By the way, I just I find that so telling about Donald Trump. It's even said that he likes beautiful women as much as I do. This is probably something that you could say of most heterosexual men, right? Do you enjoy beautiful women? Well, in what sense? Um any sense at all? Sure. I, yes, I do. Can you quantify that enjoyment? Mm, no, but uh, I assume that every other heterosexual man enjoys them to the same extent, perhaps more. I don't know. But I don't know. It's an awfully weird thing to, to bring up, let's say. What he's doing, of course, is hinting that he's got a, uh, a salacious story to, to share about him. And might be willing to do so for, you know, the right interviewer. But anyway, I guess he never did it. But beautiful women are only a part of it because, of course, he's really actually after girls. And beautiful women are only, I guess, the pimps that bring him the girls that he actually has sex with. So, you know, 
But they didn't know that at the time. Because here's the thing about Epstein, because <laughs> that's this is the thing about him in 2002. As some collect butterflies, he collects beautiful minds. Oh, that's just, that's delightful. I invest in people, be it politics or science. It's what I do, he has said to friends. And, and, and that's very charming. And I guess if you are a friend of his, that means, you know, that's flattery to you. You're a beautiful mind, right? And his latest prize edition is the former president. In his eyes, Clinton, as a species, represents the highest evolutionary form of the political animal. That may have been true. To be up close to him, as he was during the African journey, is akin to seeing the rarest of beasts on a safari. As he put it to a friend upon his return from Africa, if you were a boxer at the downtown gymnasium at 14th Street and Mike Tyson walked in, your face would have the same look as these foreign leaders had when Clinton entered the room. He is the world's greatest politician. Probably all true at the time, right? Jeffrey is both a highly successful financier, maybe, and a committed philanthropist, maybe, with a keen sense of global markets mm -hmm, and an in-depth knowledge of 21st century science. Clinton says through a spokesman. I mean, what else is he going to say? Right. I especially appreciated his insights and generosity during the recent trip to Africa to work on democratization, empowering the poor, citizen service, and combating HIV and AIDS. I mean, those are good reasons to go to Africa. Clinton is at the very least, right? He's no fool. Uh, one, he may have been just telling you the absolute truth. Well, of course, we just had a great trip to Africa to work on democratization, empowering the poor, citizen service, and combating HIV AIDS. Uh, if you're a conspiracy theorist or a Clinton hater or just Clinton suspicious, then you might think that they went for other reasons or enjoyed different things. But like I said, he's no fool. He's not going to get on there and say, well, we concocted a cover story, but basically we were just cavorting with naked girls the whole time on, on the plane. You know, he's not going to give that up. So take it for what it's worth. But Clinton knows what to say about these things. Donald Trump, on the other hand, says he likes girls. And just blurts it straight out because he's such a genius. Before Clinton, Clipstein, uh, Clipstein, no, Epstein's rare appearances in the gossip columns tended to be speculation as to the true nature of his relationship with Ghislaine Maxwell. I have no idea if I'm pronouncing that first name correctly, but we'll leave that aside for now. While they are still friends, the English tabloids have postulated that Maxwell has longed for a more permanent pairing and that for undetermined reasons, Epstein has not reciprocated in kind. It's a mysterious relationship they have. We found out more about it later. It says society journalist David Patrick Columbia. That's, is that the guy's name? There's nothing missing from that? Okay. In one way, they are soulmates, yet they are hardly companions anymore. It's a nice conventional relationship where they serve each other's purposes. Now we know what those purposes were. She was recruiting girls for him, and I don't know what she was getting out of it. Money, maybe also sex. I have no idea. Uh, it doesn't matter as much for her because she's an adult. Friends of the two say that Maxwell, whose social life has always been higher octane than Epstein's, she's got to be out there recruiting, lent a little pizzazz to the lower-profile Epstein. Indeed, at a party at Maxwell's house, her friends say... One is just as apt to see Russian ladies of the night. 2002, ladies and gentlemen. Just as apt to see Russian ladies of the night as one is to see Prince Andrew. And of course, now we learn that one of the reasons you would see Prince Andrew there is because you would be apt to see Russian ladies of the night as well as teenage girls at these parties. This is, I mean... This is like reading the, the case file before you knew it was the case file. The Oxford-educated Maxwell, described by many as a man-eater, she flies her own helicopter and was recently seen dining with Clinton at Nello's on Madison Avenue, lives in her own townhouse a few blocks away. Epstein is frequently seen around town with a bevy of comely young women, but there has been no bold-faced name to replace Maxwell. That's because he's recruiting them from middle school. You may read about Jeffrey in the social columns, but there is much more to him than that. For instance, all of his actual social life is unprintable, I guess. Says Jeffrey T. Leeds 
of the private equity firm Leeds Weld and Company. He's a talented money manager and an extremely hardworking person with broad interests. Most unusual, though, is that in this media-obsessed age, he is not in any sense a self-promoter, and that's because he was hiding a criminal background, I guess. Born in 1953 and raised in Coney Island, Epstein went to Lafayette High School. According to his bio, he took some classes in physics at Cooper Union from 1969 to 1971. He left Cooper Union in 1971 and attended NYU's Courant Institute. I have no idea how you say that, right? C-O-U-R-A-N-T. Sounds right. Where he took courses in mathematical physiology of the heart, leaving that school, too, without a degree. Between 1973 and 1975, Epstein taught calculus and physics at the Dalton School. Two years. By most accounts, he was something of a Robin Williams in Dead Poets Society type of figure, wowing his high school classes with passionate mathematical riffs. So impressed was one Wall Street father of a student. See how you can parlay Dalton School into anything, I guess, because the rich clientele. So impressed was one Wall Street father of a student that he said to Epstein, point blank, Quote, what are you doing teaching math at Dalton? You should be working on Wall Street. Why don't you give my friend Ace Greenberg a call? Period, which should be question mark. Why don't you? Epstein was in many respects the perfect candidate for Greenberg's consideration. Interesting, let's find out about this guy. Greenberg, a senior partner at Bear Stearns at the time and a legendary trader in his own right, has long made it clear that it's the hungry, brilliant guys lacking the fancy degrees that he favors at Bear, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a type. They even have an acronym, PSDs, poor, smart, and a deep D, desire to be rich. It was, I guess, poor, smart, and desire, I guess, is probably the D, not the D, but okay. It was a description that fit Epstein to a T. Well, most people probably would. Uh, he was a Brooklyn guy with a motor for a brain. And while he did love teaching, maybe, this close-up view of the rarefied Upper East Side life of his students gave him a taste for the big time. Don't know whether he tasted any of his students. So in 1976, he dropped everything and reported to work at Bear Stearns. He probably didn't think he could get away with that at the time where he started off as a junior assistant to a floor trader at the American Stock Exchange. His ascent was rapid, to say the least. So in 76, he goes to work as a junior assistant to a floor trader at the American Stock Exchange. In 1982, six years later, he opens up his own, hangs out his own shingle and says, you can only play if you've got a billion dollars to give me. And there's only 13 people in the world who have that. Hmm. Question mark. At the time, options trading was an arcane and dimly understood field just beginning to take off. To trade options, one had to value them. And to value them, one needed to be able to master such abstruse mathematical confections as the black uh, skulls, I'm hoping, a option pricing model. Look, I don't know anything about it, neither do you. But look it up. For Epstein, breaking down such models was pure sport. And within just a few years, he had his own stable of clients. I can see it. I can see it. He was not your conventional broker saying buy IBM or sell Xerox, says Bear Stearns CEO Jimmy Kane. Given his mathematical background, we put him in our special products division where he would advise our wealthier clients on the tax implications of their portfolios. He would recommend certain tax advantageous transactions. He's a very smart guy and has become a very important client for the firm as well. In 1980, Epstein made partner. 1976, drops everything, junior assistant to a floor trader in the American Exchange. 76, 80, partner. But up and left the firm in 1981. How do you like that? That is an interesting, that's a quirky figure. Right there. High school teacher, 1976. Junior assistant to an American Stock Exchange floor trader, 1976. Partner at Bear Stearns, 1980. Out the door, 1981. Working in a bureaucracy was not for him. 
What's more, in rubbing up against ever greater sums of money during his time at Bear, he began to feel the need to grab his own piece of the action. I can, and even that, I can sort of understand. And, you know, I guess if you get some eccentric clients as followers who are just swearing by your ability to make them money, uh, four to six years might even be enough to convince them of that. You know, how long does it have to go on before you think, yeah, I'll follow that guy. And you don't have to have a whole lot of clients if they're willing to give, well, money over to, but but if they're willing to give you a billion dollars in power of attorney, then I guess, yeah, how many do you really need? Hmm. All right. In 1982, according to those who know Epstein, he set up his own shop. We read this piece before beginning this. This is the excerpt that we read from Jay Isinger, Isinger, sorry, uh, tweet earlier, right? Uh, minimum buy-in, a billion dollars in power of attorney. His firm would be different too. Uh, he was not just here, not here just to offer investment advice. He saw himself as the financial architect of every aspect of his client's wealth, from investments to philanthropy to tax planning to security to assuaging the guilt and burdens that large sums of inherited wealth can bring on. I want people to understand the power, the responsibility, and the burden of their money, he said to a colleague at the time. As a teacher at Dalton, he had witnessed firsthand the troubled attitudes of some of the poor little rich kids under his charge. At Bear, he had come to the realization that, counterintuitively, the more money you had, the more anxious you became. For a middle-class kid from Brooklyn, it just didn't make sense. And you know what? Neither does any of this, to be honest. From the get-go, his business was successful, but the conditions for investing with Epstein were steep. He would take total control of the billion dollars, charge a flat fee, and assume power of attorney to do whatever he thought was necessary to advance his client's financial cause. And he remained true to the $1 billion entry fee, right? Remember that part? We also read that. You wouldn't be able to buy in at $700 million. It's nice work if you can get it. Epstein runs a lean operation, and those close to him say that his actual staff, based here in Manhattan at the Villard House, home to Le Cirque, uh, New Albany, uh, went based here in Manhattan at the uh, Villard House, also, I guess, in New Albany, Ohio, and St. Thomas, where he reincorporated his company seven years ago, and now called Financial Trust Company. Numbers around 150, and is purely administrative, so not 300 staff, but 150. Not based in Manhattan, solely, nor St. Thomas, but also New Albany, Ohio. Hmm. Why? I don't know. When it comes to putting these billions to work in the markets, it is Epstein himself making all the investment calls. There are no analysts or portfolio managers, just 20 accountants to keep the wheels greased and a bevy of assistants, many of them conspicuously attractive young women, hmm, to organize his hectic life. So assuming, conservatively, a fee of 0.5%, he takes no commissions or percentages, it says. 0.5% uh, on $15 billion. That makes for a management fee of $75 million a year straight into Jeff Epstein's pocket. Nice work indeed. Though I don't know if it pays for what he's got, right? It has been rumored that Linda Wachner and David Rockefeller have been clients too, but both parties deny any such relationship. What's more, whoever heard of a financial advisor turning down $500 million accounts? All the speculation and mystery has proved fertile ground for some alternative Jeffrey Epstein theories. Are you ready? The most bizarre of which, now this is 2002, the most bizarre has him playing the piano. He is classically trained for high rollers in a Manhattan piano bar in the mid 80s. Do you think that's it? No, uh, though that is bizarre, I guess to tell you the truth. And maybe that is even more bizarre than the actual truth. The actual truth is actually easier to believe than that he made a billion dollars playing piano for high rollers in a Manhattan piano bar in the mid eighties. Another focus of curiosity is the relationship that Epstein has with his patron and mentor, Leslie Wexner, founder and chairman of the Columbus, Ohio, uh, Ohio based limited chain of women's clothing stores. Wexner, who is said to be worth more than $2.5 billion by Forbes, became an Epstein client in 1987. It's a weird relationship, says another Wall Streeter who knows Epstein. 
It's just not typical for someone with such enormous wealth to all of a sudden give his money to some guy most people never heard of. The Wexner-Epstein relationship is indeed a multifaceted one. Given the secrecy that envelops Epstein's client list, some have speculated that Wexner is the primary source of Epstein's lavish life, but friends leap to his defense. Let me tell you, Jeffrey Epstein has other clients besides Wexner. I know because some of them are my clients, says noted M&A lawyer Dennis Block of Cadwallader, Wickersham, and Taft. I sent him a $500 million client a few years ago, and he wouldn't take him, said the account was too small. Both the client and I were amazed, but that's Jeffrey. Hmm. Uh, by the way, I guess we can probably... I don't know if we're learning anything about the current situation except to, like, raise our eyebrows at everything that gets mentioned in this story. <clears throat> so I may call it quits here, although I will note for the record that the very next sentence estimates the size, the square footage of the Manhattan residents at 45,000 square foot. So yet a third number in all this. And it was originally bought by Wexner for $13 million in 1989. So I guess uh, Epstein is at it at a minimum of $75 million cash and management fees per year from the early 80s into the 90s. So at 10 years worth of this. Uh, the house doesn't get into Epstein's possession until 1995. By the way, listen to the way it describes this. Wexner poured many millions into a full gut renovation of this house, then turned it over to Epstein. Just That's it. Turned it over to Epstein in 1995 after he got married. Uh, Wexner got married, maybe? Is that it? One story has Epstein paying only a dollar for it, though others say he paid full market price, which would have been in a neighborhood of $20 million. Epstein then undertook his own $10 million gut renovation. Wow, again. Special feature, closed circuit TV and the heated sidewalk, right? Uh, hmm. Anyway, uh, and that was his explanation for the $10 million gut renovation was, I don't want to live in another person's house. But you bought it, so whatever. Okay, there are other houses as well. Uh, just for the record, a sweeping villa in Palm Beach and a custom-built 51,000-square-foot castle in Santa Fe, said to be the largest house in the state. He wants, he wants the largest everything. The latter sits atop a hill on a 45,000-acre ranch. He had it built because of the month or so he found himself spending there, talking elementary particle physics with his friend Murray Gell-Mann, not Gell-Mann, but Gell-Mann, a Nobel Peace, uh, I'm sorry, Nobel Prize winning physicist and co-chair of the science board at the Santa Fe Institute. So he went and he talked about physics for a month, so he said, build me a 51,000 square foot castle here in case I ever do that again. He also owned a grand house, he has since sold it, near Wexner's opulent manse at the center of the limited magnate's high-end housing development in Here's the answer. New Albany, Ohio. New Albany was a lush sprawl of farmland on the outskirts of Columbus that Wexner, starting in 1988, turned into a rich village of multi-million dollar Georgian homes surrounding a Jack Nicholas designed golf course. It was a massive development project financed largely by Wexner himself. Epstein was a general partner in the real estate holding company called New Albany Partners, despite putting only a few million dollars of capital into the project. It certainly seems clear that he's getting paid by Wexner in non-traditional ways for some unknown reason. All right. Well, I mean, like I said, there's an awful lot more here and the article goes on and on and we could probably get most of the way through it in the rest of the show, but I am not certain that makes a great deal of sense. I would imagine, though, that you might all want to take a look at what's in here. Just having scrolled all the way down, by the way, um, here's a weird coincidence that it seems, it seems like a coincidence that this is mentioned here. Uh, who are we talking about here? I'm not even certain who we're now talking about, but it says down here, he, whoever he is, recently took a long position on the euro before its rebound on the basis that Europeans 
were too proud to see their currency sink any lower against the dollar. His next targets, maybe this is Epstein himself, and across the board short of the German stock exchange and a possible attack on the Hong Kong dollar peg in light of the recent disclosure of North Korea's nuclear weapons program. I just didn't think we were going to get to North Korea in this article, but amazingly enough, we did. Could it all just be strange coincidence? Sure, but it is awfully strange. I think we'll get away from this after this break. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, your host for KGRO in the Morning, with a brand new, brand new interruption to say thanks to all of you who support the show. Remember when I told you that our average monthly donation was about $7, for which you were getting two great hours of news and entertainment five days a week, and how that came out to about 70 cents an hour? That's a pretty good deal, except it's wrong. The math actually works out closer to 17 cents an hour. It is hard to beat a deal like that, and even harder to send your kids to college on. Thankfully, Patreon.com makes it easy to make that work. Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com, is the simple, secure way to make recurring monthly contributions to support our show. Just search for me or the show name on the site, and they make it easy to crowdfund the show so that the power of our numbers can keep the show going for just a few bucks a month. Once again, thanks so much for all your support. Welcome back now to the KGRO in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. There's an awful lot uh, to this. And by the way, there's a more current piece here also uh, in New York Magazine. This one entitled, uh, Everything We Know About the Sex Crimes Case Against Jeffrey Epstein. Uh, that available for a uh, a renewed look back on, I guess, the life of Jeffrey Epstein in light of what we know now. And it looks pretty interesting and comprehensive. No way we can get all the way through it today, but it might be something we comb through uh, as things progress. There are a number of other issues, of course, that I want to bring up, and uh, now we're not going to be able to get to all of them. And I had mentioned that there was sort of a, a rash of retrospective looks at the 80s that were of some interest. Uh and perhaps we can discuss them in depth at some point later in the week. But uh, uh, among them, some you would think non-political look uh, at the uh, a very interesting story, actually in Mother Jones, although I think they clearly mean for it to be connected politically and they make the connection uh, explicitly towards the end of the piece. What if we've all been wrong about what killed New Coke? How do you like that? Uh, that's an intriguing piece that maybe we can uh, discuss later in the week as we get to. I probably it sounds like a Friday piece to me, but uh, it's real interesting. Uh, right up alongside the New Republic's new entry, The Myth of the Welfare Queen. I guess in light of what uh, Greg brought to our attention yesterday about our mistakes in understanding what the message of Ronald Reagan's election might really have been, these are some other interesting takes on the 1980s and what they meant and what we should have done differently. And, of course, uh, leading into this story today, a little bit of a sidetrack, but an interesting and intriguing one about the uh, effects of that election. Imagine thinking back. Think about it's really infuriating now to think back on how much was changed for the worse by far and how much evil was uh, enabled by the the way things were done and how close that election really was. That's really quite stunning and worrisome. Okay, other stories more closely related to what's happening today. For instance, the fact that the Affordable Care Act is back in court again today, and I think uh, one of the better brief rundowns of what's going on in this case, and it's worth keeping an eye on, uh, comes from the uh, friendly neighborhood Balloon Juice blog, a good Netroots friend and familiar to everyone by now. Uh, this one by David Anderson over at Balloon Juice, noting that the ACA is in court again today, and he puts it this way. This afternoon, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals will be hearing oral arguments as to whether or not the ACA is unconstitutional. They're trying that again. The case is Texas versus Azar. 
The plaintiff states have argued and won in district court that the Affordable Care Act is unconstitutional because the individual mandate penalty has been lowered to zero and therefore is not a tax. Does everyone remember why that's relevant? Well, uh, recall that uh, the penalty for not being enrolled in insurance, uh, the, the personal mandate, the individual mandate, was a big part of the theoretical underpinning of the Affordable Care Act. It was supposed to drive you into the insurance market if you weren't before and enable the entire scheme of mandating coverage despite uh, pre-existing conditions, right? You couldn't just wait until you were ill and then buy insurance and expect your insurer to cover it that uh, even if it was a pre-existing condition, unless everybody was mandated to be a part of the system and therefore would end up essentially coming out in the wash, right? That's the thought about generalized insurance. And the original Republican attack on it was that it was somehow unconstitutional to force people to do that. But the saving throw here, to use the DND, the, the D and D terminology for it, the saving grace here, the, or the uh, the thread, the reed to which the Roberts opinion, I guess it was, or the Roberts court anyway, clung in saving the Affordable Care Act very famously was well, um, y- the federal government certainly has the power to impose these uh, this cost on you as a tax. There's no disputing that the federal government has the power to impose this as a tax. And so therefore, though they called it um, something else, the fact is that we're going to regard it as a tax. The tax is constitutional. And therefore, the whole scheme is saved because you're still going to have to pay this amount of money into the system in order to participate. But later on, the Republicans, having been handed this decision, decided, all right, well, now that we're in control of Congress and can legislate and change the terms of the Affordable Care Act, we will lower the individual mandate penalty to zero. Therefore, if zero money is being paid in, it can't really be considered a tax. And maybe the whole thing falls apart now. And well, I guess we'll see whether the relatively conservative and kooky Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals agrees with the equally kooky Fifth Circuit District Court, or rather the district court that, you know, sits within the jurisdiction of the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. I don't know where exactly it was brought down in Texas, I guess. They were willing to uh, send it up this way and say, all right, it's being taken on appeal, but we think it's unconstitutional because the individual mandate penalty has been lowered to zero. As as brain wrap, Charles Gaba, uh, or did we learn that... Uh, his the pronunciation was different. I think we did, and I made no note of it. But uh, we'll say brain wrap here, our friend, and uh, therefore someone who won't be too pissed off at us for not pronouncing the name correctly, tweeted it uh, this way. For those wondering what the lawsuit itself is actually about, here it is, broken down into three bullet points. One, the GOP set the Affordable Care Act individual mandate penalty to zero. Two, therefore, the GOP claims the penalty is unconstitutional. Three, therefore, the GOP claims the whole law is unconstitutional. That's it. That's the whole theory. You got it. And David Anderson's summary continues by saying, yeah, this is a banana pants theory, even if one assumes standing. Remember that old friend we have? The plaintiff states can't show injury. And the individual plaintiffs are only alleging psychic injury that they don't want to be admonished to buy insurance, even if there is no fiscal implication of either a buy or no buy decision. Assuming standing is not contested, and I don't know why that would be the case, this is a simple severability case. Congress knows how to repeal a law. The Congress that moved the mandate penalty from 2.5% of income to 0% and $0 of income spent several months trying to repeal the law and failing. No one who voted to repeal the individual mandate thought they were repealing the
the Affordable Care Act. They know, in other words, what repealing the Affordable Care Act looks and feels like. They tried it 60 times and couldn't get it done. Lowering the mandate to zero is not the same thing as repealing, and you shouldn't be able to get the same result from it. But that's the theory of the case. Now, David continues, the courts assume that when Congress wants to do something, they will make it abundantly clear, both within the text of the law and usually in supporting documentation. Congress wanted to get rid of the mandate costs and they had the votes to do so and that was it. The rest of the law was left intact. Unfortunately, of course, you know, this is a wacky Texas court we're talking about here and they may not give a damn one way or the other. Under the district court judge's ruling and under the argument advanced by both the plaintiff states and the Trump Justice Department, the entire Affordable Care Act has to go, which means the exchanges would have to go. It means Medicaid expansion would have to go. It means Medicare Part D gets more expensive. It means all of the delivery system reform efforts would have to go. It means calorie labeling on fast food menus would have to go. It means the taxes on upper income Americans would go. This is banana pants, but this is the argument that will be made this afternoon. That's the end of the post. I simply remind you that most of the Fifth Circuit is banana pants, and that's why they're there. And it may just be that this is another, instead of another typical case of American blind justice, it is a typical case of now American LOL YOLO NM justice. Who cares what precedent says? Who cares what judicial canons are? <clears throat> Who cares about millions of people losing their insurance and the tax system itself also being turned upside down and made 10 times worse. And the answer is not anybody who, for whatever reason, officialdom continues to claim are, in fact, federal office holders. I don't know why. They just do. That's it. So I wanted to bring you uh, up to speed on that one we won't have our answer for some time but that's what's in the offing and it's a dangerous game to be playing in the fifth circuit that's why they're there though another interesting story brought to my attention uh let's see gosh there's several of them here a lot of people have pointed to this one and i think let me switch over to twitter to see uh who did it yes rebecca romans sent us this one and I've also got something from uh, Paula Ryder who sent on uh, a different article, both of which probably deserve some mention. Let's see what we can do with it. Let's see. First of all, the one Rebecca sent is, I think, much talked about this morning and uh, probably has to do with the sensitive nature of the topic and the writer. It's Michael Isikoff writing this over at Yahoo News, his current perch exclusive the True Origins of the Seth Rich Conspiracy Theory, a Yahoo News investigation. Um, I'm going to give you 10 seconds to guess if you haven't already seen the story. What is the, according to this uh, investigation, what is the original, uh, ultimately original sourcing of the idea of, hey, let's tell everyone that Seth Rich, the DNC staffer who was killed in a bot, what, actual police think is a botched robbery in Washington, D.C. during the 2016 campaign. If you remember the name, you remember the person, you remember the stupid stories, the disgusting stories told about him and, and popularized on Fox News. Where did it all come from? If you haven't guessed by now, um, the answer is Russia. According to the investigation, in the summer of 2016, Michael Iskoff writes, Russian intelligence agents secretly planted a fake report, actual intelligence agents, planted a fake report claiming that Democratic National Committee staffer Seth Rich was gunned down by a squad of assassins working for Hillary Clinton, giving rise to a notorious conspiracy theory that captivated conservative activists and was later promoted from inside President Trump's White House. Yahoo News investigation has found Russia's foreign intelligence service known as the SVR first circulated a phony bulletin quote unquote bulletin. This is actually, you know, this is actually one of their operations disguised to read as a real intelligence report. In other words, fake intelligence that they 
disguised, you know, as I guess SVR knows what its own documents look like. And then somehow suddenly SVR is leaking somewhere along the line to American sources. Oh, my gosh. But, you know, uh, yes, you individual blogger, you found it. You cracked the code and got a hold of SVR intelligence bulletins. What a genius. Anyway, like I said, it was disguised to read as a real intelligence report, and it was about the alleged murder of the former DNC staffer on July 13th, 2016, according to the U.S. federal prosecutor who was in charge of the Rich case. It's not just some joker saying this. That was just three days after Rich, 27, was killed in what police believe was a botched robbery while walking home to his group house in the Bloomingdale neighborhood of Washington, D.C., about 30 blocks from the Capitol. The purported details of the SVR account seemed improbable on their face, that Rich, a data director in the DNC's Voter Protection Division, was on his way to alert the FBI to corrupt dealings by Clinton when he was slain in the early hours of Sunday morning by the former Secretary of State's hit squad. Yet, in a graphic example of how fake news infects the Internet, those precise details popped up the same day on an obscure website, what does it all mean? I'm sorry, what does it mean dot com, not all. What does it mean dot com that is a frequent vehicle for Russian propaganda. It may even be their own <clears throat> their own website. I don't know. I'll read on. The website's article, which attributed its claims to quote Russian intelligence, was the first known instance of Rich's murder being publicly linked to a political conspiracy. To me, Having a foreign intelligence agency set up one of my decedents with lies and planting false stories. To me, that's pretty outrageous, said Deborah Sines. I'm going to guess that's the way it's spelled anyway. Who knows how it's pronounced? S-I-N-E-S. Deborah Sines, maybe. The former assistant U.S. attorney in charge of the Rich case until her retirement last year. Many other people don't think that it's outrageous. I did. Once it became clear to me that this was coming from the SVR, then that triggers a, ver a lot of very serious questions about what do I do with this? Yeah, well, now it's a counterintelligence operation, right? The previously unreported role of Russian intelligence in creating and fostering one of the most insidious conspiracy theories to arise out of the 2016 election is disclosed in Yahoo News Presents Conspiracy Land a six-part series by the news organization's podcast Skullduggery that debuts this week on the third anniversary of Rich's murder. Which is maybe a little unseemly, but okay. That's what they're doing. The Russian effort to exploit Rich's tragic death, and, and theirs, I guess, didn't stop with the fake SVR bulletin. Over the course of the next two and a half years, the Russian government-owned media organizations RT and Sputnik repeatedly played up stories that basically alleged that Rich, a relatively junior-level staffer, was the source of Democratic Party emails that had been leaked to WikiLeaks. It was an idea that first floated by WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange, what a hero, who on August 9, 2016, announced a $20,000 reward for information about Rich's murder, saying, somewhat cryptically, that, quote, our sources take risks, unquote. At the same time, online trolls working in St. Petersburg, Russia, for the Internet Research Agency, the same shadowy outfit that conducted the Russian social media operation during the 2016 election, aggressively boosted the conspiracy theories. IRA created fake accounts masquerading as those of American citizens or political groups, tweeted and retweeted more than 2,000 times about Rich, helping to keep the bogus claims about his death in the social media bloodstream according to an analysis of a database of Russian troll accounts by Yahoo News. Speaking publicly about the case for the first time, Signs, the former prosecutor, said that the Russian conspiracy mongering vastly complicated her efforts to solve the murder by forcing her and the Washington, D.C. Police Department to investigate a blizzard of false allegations in order to make sure there was nothing to any of them. To waste your time investigating BS is just horrible, she said. The Russian-inspired conspiracy theories also have had a devastating effect on the Rich family, especially after the theories migrated to the alt-right websites and ultimately primetime Fox News shows. As they did show, so there 
were repeated suggestions by alt-right commentators that the DNC staffer's parents and brother were concealing information about his conduct. You're used, you're lied to, you're a pawn in your own son's death, said Mary Rich, Seth Rich's mother, who, along with her husband, Joel, was interviewed for the podcast. I wish they had the chance to experience the hell we've gone through, because this is worse than losing my son the first time. This is like losing him all over again. In our efforts to better understand where the conspiracy theories were coming from, Signs used her security clearance to access copies of two SVR intelligence reports about Seth Rich that had been intercepted by U.S. intelligence officials. She later wrote a memo documenting the Russian role in fomenting the conspiracy theories that she sent to the Justice Department's National Security Division, felt a lot of good that would have done, and personally briefed special counsel Robert Mueller's prosecutors on her findings. That might have helped. It appeared to me that it was a very clear campaign to deflect an ongoing federal criminal investigation, Sines said. So then you have to look at why is Russia doing this? It's not rocket science before you add it up and you go, oh, if Seth Rich is the leaker to WikiLeaks, it doesn't have anything to do with the Russians. So, of course, Russia's interest in doing this incredibly is incredibly transparent. The Russian strategy, she said, was diabolically simple. Let's blame it on Seth Rich. He's a very convenient target. The Conspiracy Land podcast traces the spread of the conspiracy theories from, or rather, about Rich. From their origins as a Russian disinformation plant, the bogus theories about his murder emerged as a persistent theme on alt-right websites and then were fanned by right-wing conspiracy entrepreneurs such as Alex Jones and Matt Couch, the founder of an Arkansas-based group called America First Media, which bills itself as the leading investigative team in America in the Seth Rich murder, which is not hard to be, I guess. <clears throat> Along the way, the idea that Rich was murdered in retaliation for leaking DNC emails to WikiLeaks was championed by multiple allies of Trump, including Roger Stone, the same day Assange falsely hinted that Rich may have been his source for DNC emails, Stone tweeted a picture of Rich calling the late DNC staffer in a tweet, another dead body in the Clinton's wake. He then added, coincidence? I think not. Can't wait for them to hang this guy. Within months, the Rich conspiracy story was also being quietly promoted inside Trump's White House. Questions about whether the White House pushed the conspiracy theories about Rich have been raised periodically over the last two and a half years and were consistently denied by White House officials, but the Yahoo News investigation uncovered new evidence that the false claim that Rich was the victim of a political assassination was advanced by one of the White House's most senior officials at the time. Huge story. He was a Bernie guy. It was a contract kill, obviously. Then White House chief strategist Steve Bannon texted to a CBS 60 Minutes producer about Rich on March 17, 2017, according to some of Bannon's text messages that were reviewed by Yahoo News. Bannon did not respond to requests for comment on this one. But by the way, <clears throat> please, 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 I'll beg you of this. This is the best part of it, I think, if you ask me. Keep this in mind when you realize how seriously Bannon is still treated by news outlets in this country. I mean, we know who he is. We know what he's done. We know all the dirty stories about him as well. But I mean, they treat him like an act. They still treat him like an actual political guru, which is amazing. But they treat him seriously. That's the worst part. And uh, I mean, I don't know what to tell you. Consider the fact that they still think he's a serious person. And yet he was texting this to 60 Minutes. That it was a contract kill, obviously. That he was a Bernie guy. What is? It? There weren't that many Bernie guys inside the DNC, I don't think, at that point. But it wouldn't matter anyway. A contract kill, obviously. How can you take that seriously? That should run through your mind every time you're thinking of taking Steve Bannon seriously at this late date. The conspiracy claims reached their zenith in May of 2017, the same week as Mueller's appointment to special counsel in the Russia probe, and remember, one of the ongoing matters is still about Roger Stone and all of this. When Fox News' website posted a sensational story claiming that an FBI forensic report had discovered evidence of Rich, on Rich's laptop that he had been in communication with WikiLeaks prior to his death. Sean Hannity, the network's primetime star, treated the account as major news on his nightly broadcast, calling it explosive and proclaiming 
it, quote, might expose the single biggest fraud lies perpetrated on the American people by the media and the Democrats in our history. And of course, it wasn't anything close to any of that. Among Hannity's guests that week who echoed his version of events was conservative lawyer Jay Sekulow. Although neither he nor Hannity mentioned it, Sekulow had just been hired as one of Trump's lead lawyers in the Russia investigation. It sure doesn't look like a robbery, said Sekulow on Hannity's show on May 18th, 2017, during a segment devoted to the Rich case. There's one thing that this thing undercuts is this whole Russia argument, which is such subterfuge, he added. So got an agenda much? Yeah, I think so. There's a lot more to this one, and we won't be able to finish it today, uh, although I think perhaps we would like to uh, divert over. Well, no, you know what? We'll keep this one that I got from Paula Ryder. <clears throat> we can discuss it tomorrow as Greg comes back to the show. I don't know what Joan's status for tomorrow is. It is, once again, uh, Netroots Nation week, and in all likelihood, she is already in Philadelphia or on her way there. And uh, they very often, I don't know, it's been many years since I've attended, as you know, I've mentioned it before, but uh, very often the Daily Coast staff will go a little bit early and get together for some meetings in the days prior and uh, just use the fact that they're all gathering for Netroots Nation as a convenient excuse for getting some good work done before the fact and that it may be that that's what she's doing on Wednesday morning. And so I don't know. It would be nice if uh, she could break away and give us an update on what hasn't yet happened, but it won't yet have happened. But it's always good to hear from her. We will see what her plans are. All right. Well, there's much more to this story. I recommend it to you and that you comb through it. It's infuriating, no doubt. Um, and uh, big question mark here, I guess, is, as I said, this is one of the ongoing cases <clears throat> including one uh, against or investigations and cases, actual cases in court against uh, or involving Roger Stone. But another, one of the big question marks is whether or not the new attorney general who to whose control these things were resigned after the closure of the Mueller investigation, whether he has been closing those investigations down, undermining them, sabotaging them, or just outright abandoning them uh, is uh, unknown at this point. Anyway, um, like I said, much more to this one, and I invite you to read it. We will, in a few minutes, be handing things over, of course, to Justice Putnam for the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, handling the uh, next segment here on Netroots Radio for the day. And, uh, well, we'll plan to be back tomorrow to read through a couple of these other things. Is there anything else? I should just quickly scan pocket and see if there was anything else that absolutely positively had to at least be hinted at today. And I'm not seeing anything that we can't wait for tomorrow on. But uh, <clears throat> there's still plenty to discuss. Okay, well, I found that uh, all very interesting. Lots to read about, about Jeffrey Epstein. We'll probably continue that discussion as well. This uh, Seth Rich one is makes for interesting reading, but I think we got the basics of what we needed to know. It's interesting that they've finally traced this thing directly to Russian intelligence and that there's a federal prosecutor, retired now, who says that that's the case and that the information was sent over to the Mueller investigation, uh, at the very least, it helps us probably fill in some of the redaction blanks that are still out there and marked as harm to an ongoing matter. Although whether or not those matters are still ongoing is, like I said, the big mystery with uh, Bill Barr in charge. Not his dad, but uh, Bill Barr himself. I don't know whether does uh, Bill Barr's, I imagine Bill Barr's dad is uh, is no longer with us, perhaps, and probably no longer the headmaster at uh, the Dalton School. <clears throat> but that was an interesting twist on things, too. All right, let's wrap it up, and uh, then I can get off the air and uh, finally uh, uh, work on getting this, you know, this persistent frog out of my throat. Just can't seem to shake it these days. 
Ah, oh well. Okay, what's up on today's West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy? Starting off in the Bistro Cafe, since we have the time to say so. Trump touted his environmental record as a biblical flood swamped Washington, D.C. It really was terrible. Did you take a look at some of the pictures? If only we had had that on the July 4th celebration. Well, that would have been a mess. We would have been spending federal dollars rescuing MAGA people, so maybe that's not such a great idea. On the rest of the menu, three states that left let undocumented immigrants get driver's licenses are handing their photos over to ICE. Ah, I can't believe it. All right, well, this is to be expected these days. A GOP senator is busted for using fake statistics about asylum seekers, and Trump has invited f- infamous right-wing bigots to the White House. What? Yes, to complain about social media. A big social media summit coming up. After this, I'll tell you what is going on on the international side. Next. From Daily Coast Radio. On NetworksRadio.com. You have been listening to the K Grow in the Morning Show with David Waltman. Yes, the second half of the program, the chef's table, where they move over to the interesting international information. Arrests of two Russians in Libya for election interference are linked directly to a sanctioned oligarch raising money for Maria Putina. How about that? There's much more, of course, coming as well. Stay tuned. 